Hello, and welcome to a special edition of 1036. I'm Portia Young. We're dedicating the next half hour to Wisconsin's $43 billion dairy industry and how the fate of immigrant farm workers could critically impact its future. Both farm owners and many of their workers continue to live in fear under the Trump administration's stance to tighten and enforce immigration standards. Immigrants make up over half of U.S. dairy workers. It's unknown exactly how many are undocumented. But what many Wisconsin farmers insist is that immigrants are vital to the success of their business and the state's dairy industry. The Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism and 12 Letter Films partnered to produce an award-winning short documentary on this very issue, Los Lecheros, Dairy Farmers. Here's a preview. Llevo trabajando 17 años para este rancho. Así, yo he visto crecer estos, estos ranchos, yo he visto crecer con la mano de obra ilegal. If I see came in here and checked my employees and found that they were undocumented and those 10 people left, my next option of course is to try to find a market for my cows and sell them. And I wouldn't be able to farm anymore. After the Mr. Trump win, my wife get worried about either me or her get deported for some reason. Hay mucho miedo, bueno, más cuando tenemos hijos, porque no saben si van a llegar y te los van a quitar. ¿Qué haces? Joining me now are several guests to discuss the issues raised in this documentary. First, Coburn Ducart, Digital and Multimedia Director for the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. John Rosenau, owner of Rosen Home Farm in Buffalo County, Wisconsin. John is featured in the documentary. Sean Duval, an interpreter for dairy producers and their workers and Georgia Pabst, a Milwaukee journalist who has covered this issue extensively, including for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Thank you all very much for being here. Mm -hmm. So Coburn, we'll start with you. Um, you worked with reporter Alexander Hall on this documentary. Can you quickly tell us how this story came about and how the film came to be? Well, the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism started covering the issue of immigrant labor on dairy farms back in 2009. And then after the Trump inauguration, we decided to take the pulse of the dairy industry and see where things were for the producers and their workers. So Alexandra uh, reached out to a number of farmers, and we met John and Sean and traveled um, to Buffalo and Pepin counties to um, meet some farmers and some workers. Did anything surprise you and Alexandra as you were reporting on this story? What, what struck you? Honestly, um, what struck me most was the trust that the people that we interviewed put in us to tell their story. Um, they entrusted us with some very sensitive information, including their full names, um, where they worked, and possibly exposed themselves to um, immigration enforcement. But they felt like the story needed to be told. And on that note, John, as you saw, you're in the clip and in the featured prominently in the film, you have chosen to be out there and exposed along with your workers because you feel very strongly about this issue. Can you speak to that? This, this um, the dairy industry is, uh, needs uh, people from Mexico to work on our farms because we are unable to find any other ones. Um, and... Um, um, it needs the uh, the public needs to know that uh, uh, these are wonderful people and uh, these are people that we need in our communities and um, um, it's my job then to speak up and um, um, it it's a uh, a difficult topic for a lot of people um, but um, as we get to know each other uh, I think uh, we can maybe solve this problem a little bit 
together. And John, you were one of the first Wisconsin dairy farmers to use immigrant workers. Yeah, back in uh, 1998, um, I was unable to uh, locate uh, anybody locally to work on the farm. Uh, nobody would apply. Uh, the people that would apply were people that you didn't want to hire. And uh, so we were very reluctantly uh, turned to immigrant labor because uh, that was all that was left. And uh, we were reluctant because we didn't know the culture, we didn't know the language, uh, we didn't know where they lived. And uh, so we had to... Uh, uh, change uh, a lot of the things that we thought about people and uh, um, but the experience that I've had with it is that uh, I don't know why I didn't do this sooner. Okay uh, well on that note let's let's watch another segment from Los Lecheros. Mi nombre es Guillermo Ramos Bravo, soy manager de este rancho, cuento con la edad de 40 años. Llevo trabajando 17 años para este rancho. Así, yo he visto crecer este, estos ranchos, yo he visto crecer con la mano de obra ilegal. Yo, yo vi un rancho de 275 años. Ahorita ese rancho cuenta con 1,500 de ordeño. Si muchos dicen que nosotros venimos a robarle el trabajo a los, a los nacidos aquí. Diecisiete años, yo nunca he visto una persona nacida aquí que venga y le diga a mi patrón. ¿Sabes qué? Busco trabajo. Quiero ordeñar vacas. very courageous for your workers to come forward, John, and very courageous for you to speak out on this issue. Why do you put your neck out there? Somebody has to say something. Uh, we as dairy farmers, uh, every one of us, uh, uh, need uh, immigrant labor in order to survive. Uh, in Wisconsin, um, I think 80% of the milk or a little bit more is produced by immigrants and uh, harvested by immigrants, I call that. And um, if uh, we lost them, uh, our whole livelihood is gone. And uh, so we need to uh, speak up. Somebody needs to speak up. And uh, um, besides, these are wonderful people. And uh, um, it, it's my duty to stand up for my employees that uh, are, are milking my cows and, and doing it right now. And what are other farmers saying to you in this moment when they see you out there speaking? I, I think all the rest of the farmers, and I can't speak for anybody really, but uh, the rest of them feel, if there was one issue that we farmers agree on, it's this issue. And uh, it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. Uh, we all agree on this issue is that uh, immigrant labor is necessary for the dairy industry in Wisconsin. Okay, on that I will read this. This story is f published by the Center for Wisconsin Investigative Journalism, but there's a longtime labor activist, his name is Neil Rainford, and he does not believe in this issue. He says that he doesn't believe that you cannot find Americans to do work on dairy farms. He says this, and I quote, the labor market for the dairy industry in Wisconsin is the same as any other labor market. If demand outstrips supply, then price of labor, and in this case wages, must increase to meet demand. What do you say to Mr. Rainford? Uh, I would like to offer him a job. Uh, I wish he would come and milk cows for me on, on Sunday nights uh, when it's 20 degrees below zero. How much would I have to pay him to come to do that? Uh, we have, uh, I, I projected that uh, if I was to attract some employees, uh, American employees, I would have to increase the wage to $20 an hour. If I increased our wage to $20 an hour for uh, uh, the labor that's uh, working on our farm, uh, in the last 10 years, I would have made money one year. Basically, there wouldn't have been any jobs left over because I'd be broke. And um, the it just... If you want to uh, come and find out how it is, um, come and try to hire somebody um, to work on the farm. 
I've had 150 people apply for jobs on my farm in the last uh, 10 years, and uh, two of them have been Americans. One uh, couldn't work uh, weekends, couldn't work on a Friday. Uh, the other one was uh, trying to fill out uh, uh, her uh, unemployment was going to run out, so she needed to apply for a job someplace. She wasn't looking for a job. Uh, the other 148 were immigrants. Let's take another look at uh, the clip from the documentary. This also points out another side of the issue, so let's take a look. I am a law and order legislator, and if somebody is here illegally, then I would expect all law enforcement agencies would enforce those laws. And if that's your business model, that you can only make um, your product affordable and accessible using illegal labor, then your model is broken. You need to either automate it more, pay more to get people to do it, or, or somehow we have to change it. Maybe we need to bring dairies closer to the urban centers um, where we have people that aren't working. To get into this country, you have to do it through a system that has checks and balances. People having to hide as a part of their life, this isn't a good thing. They're raising children as they're all trying to act like they're not even here, and, and this isn't the way it should be. We should be operating above board in the open. And we must point out that the bill never came up for a vote, and Representative Gannon was interviewed for this documentary before he died in October. So I want to get your reaction to this, uh, Georgia, because you have reported on this. AB 190, um, you said basically the clock ran out, so it's not necessarily gone. Well, it's gone for this session, so it is basically, they would have to be reintroduce it again when the legislature convenes again. And it, it, they tried it again uh, two years ago, and it also didn't get a vote. But I think in speaking to the, in terms of the needs of the, of, of the dairy farmers and other industries in the state, um, there is a, demographically, the situation of the state is that many counties are losing population. Uh, there's a low unemployment rate. People are retiring. They're dying. Children, young people are moving to other uh, jobs in, in other cities. And so there is a shortage in many industries and in many uh, workplaces for workers in Wisconsin, as there are in other Midwest cities that are, have been traditionally predominantly white. Okay. Well, let's talk about the, the history of immigration and documentation, at least as you've been covering it for the past decade. Or more, yeah. Or um, <laughs> more. No, well, I think in terms of, you know, uh, when I was at the paper at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel covering, and I covered a lot of issues regarding immigration, but also Latinos and Mexican Americans, and um, people would call me up and say, you know, what, the, what part of illegal don't you understand? My grandparents came here, they came here legally, and there is this notion, I think, that uh, everybody came here with a green card, that everybody was stamped, you mm -hmm. know, please come, and that just wasn't the case. For many years, uh, immigrants were f freely flowed into the country, and they were al an, uh, allowed to live here and stay here and readjust their status until re really recent, very recent times. And so it's a new thing that you have to uh, get in line to get here. People just got on the boat and came here or crossed the border and came here. And so this idea that everyone, he, everyone's ancestors came here mm -hmm. legally is, is really not the way uh, that reality worked in those days. But because as more people wanted to come, there was quotas and different mm -hmm. uh, laws set up to limit immigration. But it's not always been this way. And it, the laws, like any law, can change. Mm -hmm. And so the law can be changed to whatever uh, Congress and the people and the president decide that it will be. All right. And on that subject of documentation, what is your, I guess, your knowledge of the documentation of your workers? Um, as an employer, and all employers uh, are the same, is that uh, within three days of, uh, of the uh, offer of employment, uh, you need to uh, check uh, the documentation of your employee. And uh, they need to come with a, a green card and a uh, social security number. And uh, you fill out an I-9 uh, and a W-4. And um, the uh, employee must sign that. And uh, once you have done that, um, you as an employer have, uh, 
have fulfilled your requirements under the law. And uh, what my attorney tells me is that you look at the documents, and if you're a reasonable person and you look at the documents and they look real, uh, then you accept them. If you don't accept them and uh, you make a mistake and that person is, uh, and the documents are real, uh, then you are subject to uh, enforcement by the Office of Special Counsel for discrimination. Farmers losing their farms is a real, um, I guess, consequence, unintended consequence, really, of this whole issue. Let's take a look at another clip from Los Lecheros that speaks to this. Sean, let's go to you. This ripple effect, um, milk flows through Wisconsin, really. I mean, it really is our lifeblood if you think about it. It's as important to us as the potato is to Idaho. Can you speak to what would happen if John loses his workers and other dairy farmers do as well? Well, I, I interpret on probably more than 40 farms in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and certainly every single one of those farms would tell me, you know, if I lost my guys, I'd have to shut down. So you take 40 farms, I don't know how many farms there are in Wisconsin, but I'm sure there's a lot. And if they all had to close, what would happen to the price of milk that you'd have to pay in the grocery store? How about cheese? You know, how about yogurt? How about whatever? It's just, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And Georgia, if you want to add in on the ripple effect throughout the economy? Well, yeah, it, it does have a, a ripple effect on the economy in terms of uh, the workers who live in communities. They buy food, they buy shoes, they, um, especially in some of the er areas where uh, there's more agriculture and there's more families that come. And so they are living in the community and they are going to stores and they're uh, buying televisions and they're, mm -hmm. you know, part of the economy. But in terms of the immigration issue, there's also a ripple effect that happens when, uh, because of the of the uh, hyper uh, concern about immigration these days. And when, uh, after the election of Trump, many, I talked to some school principals who said their children, many of the children came to school the next day crying because they were afraid that their parents were going to be deported because they knew what the situation was. And so they started making arrangements in case they should get deported. And so it, it it rippled through the schools. Milwaukee Public Schools passed a, a, a resolution for the schools to be safe haven so that uh, immigration officials could not come to school, so that the children would not have to worry if their parents come to pick them up that they'll be, that they'll be, um, you know, apprehended. So it, it flows both economically and in terms of just the way people live their lives uh, in terms of the issue of immigration. And let's talk about trips to Mexico. John, you, you do go to see where your workers, where they live when they're not on your farm. We have a photo. There it is. <laughs> Can you describe what's, where you are? And This is uh, in Atacinca, mm -hmm. which is in the Veracruz, uh, in the uh, community of Zongalica. And uh, this is uh, Roberto's family. Um, uh, Roberto uh, works on our farm, and uh, he supports 17 different people in his uh, family by sending money home uh, that he makes up here. And uh, he's built this home. Uh, there's a uh, cement home around it as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, But I've seen that uh, so many times. And uh, I, I, first time I went in 2001, uh, I've, uh, some of the families came down from the mountains. They live a couple hours above uh, Orizaba. Mm -hmm. uh, in the state of Veracruz, and uh, uh, they came down to visit us down in the uh, in the town, and uh, dressed in their finest. Uh, and it was a very touching experience. Uh, two years later, I went back and uh, traveled up to uh, uh, Tepan Sequoco with uh, Roberto Montelvo, uh, uh, who had just got home, and uh, we uh, drove up there in the evening or in the, in the night. Got there about ten o'clock, and we had a walk down to the village because there was no road. Um, when we walked into the village that day, uh, they said uh, the village is um, many thousands of years old and we were the white, first white people to walk into that village. I, I slept in uh, Roberto's bed that evening and um, 
um, it was such a moving experience um, that uh, I've gone back nine times. Why are these trips so important to you? Well, uh, other than the uh, obvious that uh, here I am, a rural Wisconsin guy that uh, hasn't traveled a whole lot, and I, I love farming, and that's what I do, uh, to see uh, another country, a world, third world country, basically, um, that had a major impact on my life. But what more importantly, I think, um, is that uh, uh, in order to be a good employer, uh, what you need to do is you need to understand uh, who your employees are, you need to understand their wants and their needs. Uh, you need to understand their culture, and you also need to understand how to communicate with them. And uh, prior to that, I hadn't done much of any of that with my Mexican employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, by traveling down to uh, Mexico and visiting their families and seeing where they live and seeing why they're up visit, uh, working at our farm and seeing what they do with the money that they send home and stuff like that, it was invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, they... Uh, the word about uh, me being down in those villages uh, spread pretty fast. Uh, everybody at home knew about it uh, long before I got home. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were photos on the walls, and uh, uh, it was dramatic. And um, it's, it's something that I think everybody should do. Uh, then the uh, immigration debate would, would subside. And, Sean, you, you help arrange these trips, right? Yeah. The first trip trip we took was in 2001 and we've taken at least one trip a year since and so I think if you multiply that out it's probably 250 maybe 300 people um, from all walks of life but primarily dairy producers and the change that that comes over them is is huge um, both it affects both the families at home the employees here and the employers and um, it's uh, it, and it, it really creates a bond between the employees and the employer. And I like, to, I like to liken it to if somebody, if you went to Siberia, let's say you had a job offer in Siberia, and you didn't know where you were, and your family here at home even less knew where you were, imagine how good it would feel to your family and to you to have your employer come here and meet them. It's huge. It's just huge. And, it, and it's not rocket science. It's just easy. It's just caring about people. And Colburn, you were on... One of you saw the day that the family was going back to Mexico. Yeah, it's kind of that um, ending where you just don't know what's going to happen next. And I think that's really the power of Los Lecheros. Mm -hmm. So what happened after we did our first report is filmmaker Jim Cricky contacted us and wanted to make a film about our reporting on um, immigration on dairy farms um, because of Sean's connection uh, with the family that you see in the film, the Hernandez family. We learned that they were going back to Mexico because they were fearful of um, what would happen after Trump was inaugurated. And they waited until their young son was graduating from preschool. He was four years old. The day after his graduation, uh, the father drove off in the morning to head, head back home. And we were there. Um, Jim was there with his camera to film that moment. And it's a very emotional, um, it was a very emotional 24 hours for the family and for us. OK. So as we wrap up, what are some final thoughts? And I guess. My first question, I'll start with Colbert again. Um, what do you want to see happen now that this film is out there and that people have seen it? And it seems embraced it. Yeah, well, I think this is just the beginning of a conversation. This is obviously a situation that's been going on for many years. And I think through the film, we're able to educate people and bring them to the farm and meet people um, you know, virtually through the film that might not be exposed to a dairy farm or the people that work there. And so um, this is just an ongoing conversation that we hope um, will just be the start of, of something that will, that will continue. John? Uh, us, us farmers, uh, we want to uh, farm. And um, we uh, need employees uh, more than anything. You know, that's the most important thing that we have on the farm. Um, and uh, uh, somehow um, this uh, issue needs to be uh, addressed. And uh, I think the best way for all of us to uh, learn how to deal with immigrants is to get to know one. And uh, I think uh, as you get to know them as people, uh, all of a sudden all the uh, fears disappear. Sean? Yeah, I would echo that. I would say that, you know, just to remember that each of these people is here because they've got a family that they're trying to support at home. And to think 
a little deeper than just the stereotypes that are out there that all employers are abusing them or they're all taking advantage of the system. It's individual by individual and, and just don't, don't lump them into any one category because we're all people after all. Okay. In Georgia, the political climate, um, you're think, reporting, <laughs> will you be reporting right. another I decade think, on this? I think politically it's just very untenable. I think uh, everyone has taken their side and nobody wants to, I mean, uh, there was a hope a few years ago with uh, the McCain-Kennedy bill that almost, it passed in the Senate, did not pass in the House. Uh, unless there is a, the political will to change it and to do something, uh, the standoff continues. All right. Thank you all for being here Thank you. on this very special edition of 1036. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us and really showing us this world that many people don't really get to see. So I really thank you. Learn more about Los Lecheros on MilwaukeePBS.org and on our Facebook page. The documentary will also be featured on the June 14th edition of Adelante. 1036 returns on June 21st right here on Milwaukee PBS. Thank you for being here. I'm Portia Young.